Hey lovely people, um, today I wanted to talk about film noir with you guys. Um, I quite like to, I love talking about movies, specific movies, but I think it's quite nice to talk a little bit about um, film history and context and things like that. So um, yeah, today we're talking about film noir. <laughs> so the name film noir, come, it's French, in case you can't tell. <laughs> the French actually identified this movement within the American cinema. So more specifically, Raymond Bourde and Etienne Chometon, um, they wrote about this movement in film in post-war France. So they hadn't, uh, the French hadn't seen a lot of American films whilst um, the war was going on. And so when cinemas opened up again and American films started to be played, um, people were kind of like, wow, Films are a lot darker than they used to be coming out of America. So that's the, the noir <laughs> in film noir. Um, I think it just sounds very evocative as well. So the name kind of stuck. Um, it wasn't something that uh, people working in cinema were specifically trying to do. It's just something that, uh, like a lot of movements in different forms of art, the label often comes part of the way through the movement or even after so um yeah people working in film noir weren't necessarily calling themselves or calling their films film noir um so this the time period we're talking about for classic film noir or true film noir is about the mid 40s to the early 50s uh people do argue that it's uh later than that um, but roughly most people <laughs> seem to agree that it's about the Maltese Falcon to the Kiss Me Deadly era. Um, Neo-noir, on the other hand, which is like, takes the tropes of film noir, but is made in a later period, that's still alive and kicking. Um, so I did notice that as I was reading up on this, some people have defined film noir as continuing into the early 60s. I think the really classic film noir, just in my opinion, I mean it's just an opinion, but um, I think that 40s to 50s era is really important because I think when you think of film noir, that's the era that you think of. Um, I th the question that keeps coming up is some people call it a genre and other people call it a movement. I think after reading a bunch of stuff about this, I think I kind of feel like it's a movement, but I suppose you could call it a genre, but it's not like super set in stone with what um, constitutes a film noir. So what I found, which was kind of nice, is there's a, not a lot of definitive answers, but there is a lot of talk. So if somebody says to me like, oh, what is film noir? It's... I couldn't tell you like the five things it has to have to be considered film noir, um, if that makes sense. So if you think of like other genres like romance or westerns, they're much more defined about their locations and things like that. So the interesting thing is because of that, um, film noir has been talked about a lot. So there are loads and loads of books on this. There are film festivals. Um, there's a lot of academic back and forth, uh, which I think is kind of fun when you're reading about it and you kind of have one person says one thing and then somebody else is like, oh, I read that guy's article, it was crap. Like, this is what I think. <laughs> so that kind of academic debate is always fun. Um, but obviously, you see to take it with a pinch of salt a little bit. So when we're talking about film noir, what are we going to be seeing on the screen? Uh, basically, the first thing, is that it's going to be in black and white. Um, that's because that's the film stock they had at that era, but it's also because black and white film shows light and shadow in a different way than color film does. Some of the, the uses of shadow in film noir is really, um, really indicative of what kind of film you're watching. Like, you know, it's film noir because it's using light and shadow. And that kind of contrast comes from black and white. So you can, like neo-noirs are often in color. It's not like you can't, I mean, I mean, you could probably argue this point, like, but um, 
that's kind of a key thing for film noir, or should I say maybe classic film noir if you prefer. Um, to kind of follow on from that, lighting is really key. The use of shadows is, to me, the first thing I think of with film noir. Um, shadows and silhouette. So there's a... The final scene of the big combo is really famous for its final shots where two figures are in the fog in silhouette. It's very dynamic. It's very um, flat, sort of black and white. Um, sometimes you will get a character lit from behind so their shadow goes up the wall in a kind of almost subconscious, dreamlike, kind of surrealist, uh, creepy kind of a way. Um, the lighting as far as um, the actual actors go is quite different as well. Um, it's probably kind of technical and maybe not super interesting, but the way uh, women or, or actresses are lit in film noir is a little bit different than in other films. They have like um, a key light and a kick light difference, basically. So they get this sort of luminous quality, but they get like a slightly flat look and it's not a soft light. So sometimes you, if you think of old, old romance films, the starlet will like gaze upwards and they'll have this soft gauze kind of look. You'll, you'll probably never see that in film noir. And now that I've said that, somebody's probably gonna be like, here's an example. So that's film noir for you, but, um, the reason that's important is women are not being romanticized in film noir. They are not sort of um, innocent. They're more... The look makes them a little bit more hyper real almost. Maybe that's not the best word. So they're not soft, innocent, yielding. They're strong. They're a little bit more inscrutable. They have this kind of um, perfection to them where you can see their faces very clearly. They're very defined. Um, and personally, I quite like that. <laughs> I think it's nice. Uh, again, to sort of talk about the kind of uh, some of the acting um, or maybe I should put this another way. One of the other things you see a lot in film noir, let's see, you don't see it, it's voiceover. <laughs> but one of the other things you'll notice in film noir is the voiceover. So the protagonist in film noir um, is usually male. I can't off the top of my head think of an example where the main character is female. Um, so if there is one, you can let me know in the comments because I might watch it but um generally the protagonist is male and he has a voiceover sometimes that's at the start sometimes it's sort of bookend start and finish or sometimes it's all the way through but he is telling us his story from his perspective so it's very individual um and it's very um the way it implies that the what we're seeing is how he sees those people because it's his film, it's his story. So um, everyone in it is potentially from his perspective, uh, which is kind of interesting. I guess you could kind of talk about how reliable a narrator is and that kind of thing. Um, but I feel like the voiceover is something very iconic from these films. It's not in every single film though, um, but you will find it a lot. There's an influence of German expressionism in these films, if you're kind of, trying to place that um my go-to example is always the um, cabinet of dr caligari um and i think there's some strong use of shadow and uh interesting angles in that in those in that film specifically but in in german expressionism more broadly um and you really see that in film noir quite a lot um uh, different um it's actually quite clever, a lot of the camera work, and then you'll get like point of view shots and low things and high things, and sometimes things will be designed, um, they'll use shot reverse shot, but it will be slightly off, or it just kind of disorients you slightly and gives you a sense of like strangeness, um, which is unsettling, 
And that's kind of the point of film noir. Um, people after the war were feeling a bit unsettled and strange. And the protagonist of these films is often um, <laughs> going through something a little bit because of the subject matter of these films. So uh, that German expressionism is seen. You can kind of see those things quite strongly. Um, it's not necessarily a direct, uh, direct influence. Some directors that worked in German expressionism did escape Europe and went to America and were working in those studios. So that probably exposed directors to those films and they probably picked up things they liked as opposed to directly um, those directors just going to America and working in film noir. So, although some of them did, <laughs> but it's not necessarily like a direct, um, you know, movement from one place to another. Um, so the locations in these films, there's a lot of different, film noir covers quite a few different kinds of stories, but um, there was a really interesting um, couple of articles I read about the locations so sometimes it's night streets at night and shadows going up walls is very film noir um, night shoots can sometimes be cheaper sometimes you can use a location or a set from a film that's being used during the day sometimes using um, a night shoot can mean you're just putting more hours into one day so while you've got the actor that day you know, you can kind of like skip, push everything into one week and keep your budget down. <laughs> At least you could then. Um, so that's partly some of the reasons for night shoots. But again, it creates um, an uncomfortableness, a sense of, you know, uh, crime and danger and things like that happen at night as well. So sometimes it's a choice. It also means you've got, again, like that contrast of light and shadow is very strong at night. So you can play around with that. But if you're not in the street in a film noir film, often you are in a bar or a lounge, uh, a boarding house. So the characters in these films are not, um, they're not housewives, they're not doing nine to five jobs. Um, they are not, uh, their lives are transient. So sometimes there's somebody who is literally sort of going across America, job to job, seeing what they can get. People that have come back from war and are trying to slot back into society but they don't really fit anymore that's kind of a bit of a theme as well um but i think the criminal sort of element of these films is kind of um you know more likely to happen in a bar i guess uh that kind of thing so yeah it's interesting and i think the idea that these people are just renting in their lives and it's very much that like I said, paycheck to paycheck kind of a life. Um, these people didn't, and I think they still, people maybe still don't get shown in movies as much as kind of somebody that lives in a house, you know, that kind of uh, more permanent, um, I mean, I suppose there's probably a class distinction there. I don't really know, but um, yeah, these people do not have those kinds of lives. And yeah, um, so that kind of makes for an interesting um, layer of meaning in films like this. Um, these films are often B-movies, so not all the time. Again, with film noir, every time you pick something like, oh, this is from film noir, and then you're going to say, but not in everyone. But often there were B-movies, which means sometimes they were low, low budget, sometimes they were big budget, sometimes they were from smaller studios as well. Um, like RKO or somebody like that um, without going too much because I feel like B movies would be like <laughs> its own video because it's kind of fascinating but generally there there was a period of time where cinema people stopped going to the movies a little bit and so they were doing things with um, with block booking and packaging up an A movie and a B movie so an A movie would be something that was big had big star in it everybody wanted to see it and then the b movie was sort of um the buy one get one free sort of a thing so doesn't mean that they were bad films um i think a lot of 
they, I feel like there's a bit of a stigma around B-movies. Like, people either love them or they're like, oh, it's a B-movie, you know? And uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, but I think it's quite fun to watch old B-movies. There's a lot of things in them that you just don't see in the A-movies. Different kinds of people or different kinds of stories. Um, so, yeah. But I, I think I might make a B-movie video for you guys at some point to talk about, you know, the studio system and block booking and stuff like that. Um, so women in film noir, this is probably my, initially my favorite thing about film noir, <laughs> is, is the women in film noir. Um, the femme fatale figure comes from this genre. Um, that's a woman who is deadly. Um, so there are some good girls in film noir. There, sometimes there's, like the girlfriend who the protagonist sort of is going to marry but he kind of keeps getting drawn back into his old life by a film femme fatale from his past that kind of thing but generally speaking most women in film noir are sometimes they're prostitutes they work in lounges they're they're the same kind of paycheck to paycheck people or Sometimes they're the, the girlfriend or the wife of like a wealthy criminal or basically they're off in trouble. And this was like a big response to uh, women's roles changing after the war. So men went away to war, they came back. Sometimes their wives hadn't been faithful to them while they were away. Sometimes their girlfriends had married someone else. There's a little bit of that. But the biggest thing would was that whilst men were away at war, women had been doing their jobs. So they, they kind of left um, with, I don't want to say naive. I'm, I'm kind of thinking in my mind, I'm like, they left women at home who were sort of innocent, stay at home, ready to be housewives, and they came back to women who knew what they wanted. And so the femme fatale is kind of often a response to that, that women are maybe... A bit more knowing and a bit more knowledgeable and a bit more savvy and a bit more less less innocent and more manipulative uh, maybe they have things that they want for themselves now that wouldn't have occurred to them at least in men's minds before the war so um it's just kind of interesting to see that change um femme fatales never really win <laughs> So, or maybe they do, I don't know, but I'd say generally they sort of, they're a woman that knows what she wants, often a woman that has a job, um, or has some kind of money, or wants money, and it all kind of backfires on her, so, it's interesting. Um, the protagonist himself is often an anti-hero, uh, my note on this just says, from the detective to the drifter, so... Uh, the Philip Marlowe, Sam Spade is the classic like detective film noir that a lot of people know. Um, but also the drifter that, you know, he's come back from the war. He doesn't really fit into suburbia. He's kind of drifting from place to place. That's often a character as well. Somebody that also just kind of drifts into trouble. <laughs> um, lack of morality is a a key theme of a lot of the stories that were chosen which kind of links up with post-war disillusionment um in the u.s a lot of what i was reading about for this a lot of it was like men went to war and they came back and there was like a lack of morality and they were like why did i you know watch my friends die and fight for this place where i don't i come back and i don't belong and there's no work and all this kind of thing. So there is um, a lot of disillusionment amongst people that came back from war, which is something that when people talk about like, oh, the good old days, the 50s, it's like it was only, it really wasn't that great. There's <laughs> a lot of disillusionment about everything. Um, so that again feeds into the lack of morality in these stories. Obviously these stories are quite, for the time, quite dark. Um, So the protagonist often is 
almost nihilistic, doesn't really believe in anything, doesn't have much that he cares about, and sometimes he's willing to... Well, often he's willing to break the law, sometimes he's willing to commit murder um, or other crimes. Um, so that sense of fair play and right and wrong and that kind of thing is really not something that fits in these films. Um, yeah, and especially, I mean, the femme fatale will lie to get what she wants, she will kill to get what she wants. Um, and it's the same with the protagonist. And I think that's something that comes across very strongly because when you think of the protagonist of a movie, often they're like the hero of the movie and they go through things and come out better. And in these films, the protagonist goes through things and either comes out in jail or dead or just the same. <laughs> he doesn't learn anything. Um, except maybe not to trust people even less than he already does. So um, I think that's another thing that kind of hooks me about these movies is that kind of dubious morality. The um, production code and things like that were still in place at this time. So um, the it was kind of, you couldn't have a movie where the bad guy wins at the end. So some film noir you will see the end feels almost like tacked on, like, you know, they wanted the they wanted the bad guy to get away with it, but then they're like, no, oh, we can't do that in the movie. But sometimes if you read the book of some of these, the ending is even more bleak. Um, so I guess I kind of already mentioned um, these films being a response to kind of the 50s ideal of home. These people just live for the day, make ends meet. They live in boarding houses, not homes. They have to do what they can to get by. Often you'll see the detective sleeps in his office. Like he just lives, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, or the women make money by their looks or that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it was kind of very much an in response to Hollywood manufacturing. Um, the ideal sort of home and family sort of a thing. Um, these films, I guess I kind of touched on this, but there's a sense of fate in these films a lot. And I mean, I said there isn't, there's really no happy ending. Um, I think some of them, you could kind of argue that there's like a not really bad ending. Some of them do have just a horrible, like <laughs> just <to> end <laughs> and you're like, oh, great. <laughs> Um, I think Detour is a really good example of fate. Um, I will talk about that in a little bit, actually. But um, yeah, it's a sense of the protagonist's nihilism and that kind of thing, kind of feeling that it doesn't matter what you do, the cards are just stacked against you, or that, you know, you could just, you could pick up a hitchhiker and then just go down, like everything bad can happen and you can just fate puts a finger on you and you're just gonna you know get nailed by some con artists or whatever um and again i think that's feeding into like a feeling and i do think i mean obviously it's years later than um than when the classic kind of these films came out but that kind of sense of like you know you can't do anything about it and that kind of thing Sometimes you watch these and you're just like, yeah, that's kind of how it feels sometimes, you know, <laughs> like, so, um, yeah, those are kind of some of the tropes. Um, so film noir kind of arguably again, ended with color. So cinema started to change, uh, in the late fifties. Um, they weren't, they weren't doing block booking anymore. Um, the monopoly of the studio system started to be, I mean, obviously, Monopoly isn't good, so they started to break up the block booking and they that kind of thing changed, so there were no more B-movies. Um, the advent of TV changed the industry as well. And I think one of the biggest things um, from the production aspect is that color came in. So people wanted to see color films a little bit more and film noir really lends itself to black and white film stock because of the kind of effects you want to get 
and the light and shadow and that kind of thing. Um, so you could argue, and people do argue, that film noir has to be black and white, and that once it's in color, it's neo noir. Um, or you can say, you know, film noir continued into the 60s. It, it kind of depends on um, which stance you want to take, really. <laughs> um, so I thought I would kind of round this up for you with uh, some recommended examples of film noir, because as you might have noticed up until this point, I've talked about what the films look like and what kind of characters are in them, but what is a typical film noir plotline? So if you think of a romance, you're going to have a fairly straight line with variations. Um, you're going to have a couple and by the end they're going to be together and they're going to have gone through something in the process. Um, or in a Western, you're going to, it's going to be set in a certain place. There's going to be like cowboys, there's going to be bad guys, like black hats and white hats, and somebody's going to have to defend the town or whatever. And in film noir, because it's arguably <laughs> more of a movement than a genre, there are a lot of different plot lines um, and a different things that you can have in there. So I thought it might be kind of more fun to talk about some examples as opposed to, um, you know, just throwing some plot lines at you randomly. Um, so there's a lot of film noir. These are just literally some that I like and that are well known and you'll be able to find them easily and that kind of thing. Um, they're in no particular order and they're just ones that I like. So um, obviously this, what I'm trying to say is this is not like a definitive list or a you must watch these or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you kind of wanted to get your introduction to film noir, these would be some good ones to start with. So the first one is obviously, I mentioned this, the Maltese Falcon. Um, so this one is from 1941 and uh, this one is sometimes credited as being like the first one or loosely the first film noir. So this is a Humphrey Bogart um, and Mary Astor film. Mary Astor is the femme fatale in this and it has private detective. <laughs> so Humphrey Bogart's a detective and he gets caught up in looking for a priceless statuette and um, there are like three people, well there's a bunch of people that basically want the statue and everyone's double crossing everyone and it's a really entertaining film um i think it's been remade a few times but um i like this one because i like humphrey bogart and it has that real like detective film noir um aesthetic that you know sometimes when you have those like they'll do it in cartoons a lot where it'll be like she walked into my office and it's sort of got like the you know so this is kind of one of the initial places that, that kind of thing comes from. This one is based on a Dashiell Hammett uh, novel. So um, I will kind of mention him at the bottom somewhere. Um, so yeah, Maltese Falcon um, is a really good one. Um, the Big Sleep in from 1946. Again, this one's Humphrey Bogart. Uh, the Big Sleep has Lauren Bacall in it. And um, I think this might have been the film where they actually met these two, so. Um, I don't know, that's just a fun point. They're one of the famous kind of couples from Hollywood. Uh, it's directed by Howard Hawks. And this one has another private detective. This one's um, Philip Marlowe. Um, how to describe this film? So some of film noir films, especially where they were adapted from detective novels, um, the plot is almost like there's a detective and somebody comes in and asks him to find someone or find something and then in the process he finds that he's being double crossed by someone so then he kind of goes follows the thread to see what's really going on and then everyone's double crossing everyone and there's some murder and some blackmail and some this and some that and then sometimes at the end they will be just like some loose ends <laughs> where it's like something will happen and you'll be like oh okay that's all resolved and then later at night you'll be in bed and you'll be like yeah but why 
how did the chauffeur <laughs> do the thing? Like, so um, I think that's kind of one of the fun things about these, to be honest. Um, it's not something that bothers me. I don't think it bothered people at the time either. Um, but this one uh, has sort of a wealthy family, um, which is kind of an interesting point because whilst I was saying before, a lot of these films are set in lounges and the kind of down and out, often, fairly often, there's a contrast of somebody that's quite wealthy um, who doesn't have to worry about anything. And again, they have zero morality because they have money, which is kind of interesting because the other characters have zero morality because they have no money. So <laughs> just one of those things. Um, but The Big Sleep is great. It's really entertaining. It's got some good one-liners and stuff. Um, so it's a bit of a favorite of mine. Um, Postman Always Rings Twice, 1946. I think I've actually talked about this one um, in a review post. I don't think I did a video about it, but um, this one is kind of a little bit different. So John Garfield is a drifter. He comes into town, not into town. He comes into um, a place and there is a guy and his wife is young. She always wears white. She's really, really hot and she's played by Lana Turner. So this is one of the ones where the protagonist is kind of convinced by an absolutely stunning, beautifully dressed woman to murder someone. <laughs> or sometimes it's committed a crime, but generally it's to murder someone and she kind of has it all sort of figured out and you kind of wonder, did she, was she just waiting for someone to turn up or, you know, how much does she really feel? Is she a psychopath? <laughs> Is she an opportunist? Um, this one has really great performances in it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. So I do recommend this one. Um, the title is kind of fun. I've read some different things about why it's called this. Um, I don't want to tell you the ending in case you want to watch it, but there's kind of a, a thing where they get away once, but it doesn't work twice, like kind of thing. Uh, well, that's a pretty terrible way to explain it, but um, there's also some quotes of the author um, pointing out that it doesn't mean anything, but it sounds good. So yeah, so this is one of the murder plot kind of ones. Um, these people are not not wealthy, um, that kind of thing. There's some of these have um, insurance scams or another thing where uh, and somebody will get life insurance on someone. Um, so it's another kind of the insurance man instead of the detective. Which brings us to Angel Face. Uh, this is an Otto Preminger film. Um, so Robert Mitchum is, uh, he's an ambulance driver actually, not an insurance agent. And um, he kind of gets tied up with Gene Simmons's character, Diane, um, and she, She's a femme fatale, she is like obsessed. She knows what she wants and she's one of those like, I know what I want and I'm gonna get it type of people, except this is a film noir, so it all kind of goes in a dark direction. Um, I absolutely love Jean Simmons in this. She is so good. This is a film that has the example of sort of the good girl, so the guy, the main character, I should say, um, Robert Mitchum's character, he has sort of a girlfriend who would lead him onto a good path and then the femme fatale who's leading him off on a bad path. So he's kind of got the irresistible pull to danger, which sometimes manifests in these films. Um, yeah, I like this one. I I like the difference where Robert Mitchum is um, kind of drawn to this person, but also a little bit repelled because he's kind of aware that he's being manipulated and I think the um the scheming and kind of Gene Simmons's characters planning and plotting is really entertaining um so this is a really good one it's 1953 if you're looking for it um what else is on my list Gilda of course Gilda has to go on a film noir list so if you guys have seen um 
a Shawshank Redemption. There's a moment where Gilda does the little hair flip. Uh, it's Rita Hayworth. And um, yeah, she's on a poster on his wall in that movie. So um, I don't know. It's just something if you've never heard of Gilda that you might kind of recognize from other pop culture. Um, Gilda's 1946. As I said, Rita Hayworth is the title character. Um, so Glenn Ford is a gambler, that's how he makes his money, and um, he heads somewhere and he's hired by basically like a criminal, <laughs> and uh, the criminal's wife is his ex-girlfriend, so there's kind of a bit of a love triangle thing going on. Um, this is an interesting one because it kind of reminds me of something I didn't talk about. Uh, there are some people that bring up a kind of... Uh, homoeroticism in these films so in Gilda um, both of the men oh, both of the men love Gilda but there's also kind of a little bit of chemistry between the two guys so sometimes that kind of thing is hinted at a little bit in these films people you can argue about which ones it's in but um, it's just kind of an interesting interesting thing to notice um, yeah so Glenn Ford Rita Hayworth uh, this one is, yeah, I mean, Gilda kind of is the femme fatale. She kind of leads him astray. There's a murder plot. There's some twists. It's a good one. Uh, and it's a total classic. And also, I just absolutely love Rita Hayworth in this movie. She's amazing. Uh, Detour. So this is more of a, um, I mentioned this one before. Uh, so this is 1945 and it has a great performance from Anne Savage in this actually. So the main character is Tom Neal. He's a, he works in a nightclub and, um, he's hitchhiking to go across country to meet up with his girlfriend, I think. And in the course of events, uh, initially someone dies and then he thinks he's going to go down for the murder and then I'll, like sort of just there's there's blackmail there's deception there's death like it all just kind of unravels and there's this sense of um you know as if fate just got bored one day pointed the finger at him and then that's it he's just going down no matter what he does um so this is a good one I've definitely talked about this one on uh on my site somewhere if you want to take a little deeper dive into into that one um uh kiss me deadly is probably the last one i will recommend even though there's loads um because kiss me deadly is the one i mentioned initially as some people claim this is kind of the last one um so this one has uh this one opens really well actually it has this really interesting opening sequence where there's a um there's a woman on a highway and it's edited in a really interesting way and it's sort of slightly disorienting and uh, the way the um, titles are played on the screen is kind of like the way words are written on a road. I don't know, I'm explaining this badly, but um, it's an interesting opener and it feels a little bit more modern than some of the earlier ones. The shots are even less static and even more kind of angled and things like that. Um, this was based on a novel written by Mickey Spillane and yeah so basically there's a guy called Mike Hammer and he's driving along and then this girl gets into his car and she's running away from something and then everything just gets really dark <laughs> so events kind of spiral from there he's drawn into like this plot she knows about um she knows a secret and they don't want the secret to get out and then everyone's after um this thing i think in the film they just call it the great what's it and it's not really from what i remember it's not really explicitly said that it's like a nuclear um a nuclear bomb or something um but yeah basically everyone wants it and at the end i mean i guess Part of the implication of this film is that if Mike Hammer had stayed out of it and not meddled um, because he's amoral and whatever, um, then it wouldn't the bomb wouldn't go off at the end. Uh, but the interesting point about the end of this film is that 
um, a woman who is curious and knows too much and is basically a femme fatale <laughs> needs to be punished, whatever. So at the end of the film, she opens the thing and this light comes out. And um, initially, in one of the key prints of the film, somebody that was loading the film like mangled the end so the last couple of shots weren't there so some people say there's an alternate ending of this film but it's not actually the alternate ending it's just the very end of the film should show well i guess i'll kind of spoil the end for you anyway but should show two people on the beach um and the implication is like they didn't get blown up in the bomb but the nuclear fallout will kill them anyway isn't that a great ending <laughs> it's so dark <laughs> so that kind of preoccupation with um, bombs and things like that is very 1950s and I guess it's kind of maybe ushering in some themes that are more modern than what really belongs in film noir. You could definitely argue that. <laughs> um, so maybe, I think that's why a lot of people feel like that's kind of the, this is kind of like one of the last films of this movement, um, at least in classic sense. So I know I kind of told you what happens at the end of Kiss Me Deadly. The ending is really famous, so I feel like it's not like a major spoiler, but it is a really interesting film. It's way darker than, like, than you think it's going to be. Um, I've covered this as well. If you want to maybe look, uh, look it up on my site and, or you could just watch it. But um, I feel like watching this one, I always think like, how did they get away with that? <laughs> Like, how were they allowed to, like, there's some, like, torture in this and a bunch of stuff. So it's not, it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's a heavy film, but it would have been heavy at the time. Um, so that's Kiss Me Deadly. So there's a, just a, some, if you're like, oh, I've never seen a film noir or something. Um, there's a, some of the ones that I just recommend. Um, so neo-noir and techno-noir. <laughs> techno-noir, that's doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, a great example of neo-noir is a film called Chinatown. Um, it is, it's made in the 70s, but it's set in the film noir era and it has all of the kind of, it's in color, but it has a lot of the like the visuals and, you know, the character types and all that kind of stuff. That film noir has so it's a really great example of neo-noir um another one that i feel like doesn't get mentioned very much as far as neo-noir goes is devil in a blue dress um i think it's great because uh the book is really good as well <laughs> uh walter mosley has a um a black detective as his main character so it's kind of just mixes it up a little bit uh, something interesting that came up and I made a note of this, I don't know if anybody is an X-Files fan, but um, X-Files is massively influenced by film noir and I never noticed it the whole time I watched the X-Files. Not that I'm, I'm not really a fan, I skip all the alien episodes, um, so I think they're boring. <laughs> you can hate me if you want. Um, so yeah, but it's like once you kind of see that, you're like, oh yeah, like the clothes they wear and like, yeah, definitely. Techno Noir um, is stuff like Blade Runner, uh, the original Blade Runner. Um, the outfits, if you look at that movie, they're very like 40s-esque, especially um, for the female characters. And um, there's that sense of fate in that film as well and a lack of morality. And some people being expendable and kind of, you know, the wealthy people and the poor people and the detective. And so you can kind of see, like, Blade Runner is basically a film noir set in the future. Um, so, yeah. Obviously, there's more than that, but I just feel like it's such a good example. You can kind of almost just end with that one. Um, further reading. If you want to know more, because obviously this is just like a, a dip into things. My favorite book on film noir is the Film Noir Compendium. Um, it's written by Elaine Silver and, no, it's not written by, it's edited by um, Elaine Silver and James Ursini. So the reason I love it is because if you normally grab a book on film noir, 
it will be from one perspective. And it will be somebody arguing um, their point or talking about things like, film noir is definitely a genre, film noir is definitely this. And I think the film noir compendium is the best because it's that's not how it works. It's It starts um, with the board and Shomaton article. It has articles from um, contemporary to film noir and films coming out of like American critics and people like that saying like, wow, these films are kind of dark. And then it goes all the way through to like modern day with different um, different writers. They're all academics and they have some really interesting perspectives and you just, it's so great because you have one article, like one thing that says um, it's like this and then another one will sort of say, oh, I read that guy's thing and I think that. And I think the best way to kind of capture that sense of debate around film noir and different perspectives and different opinions is in this book. And like I said, because they're all academics, they actually know what they're talking about. It's researched. It's not just like someone's opinion, you know? Um, so that's the one I would recommend. I'm not going to recommend any others, basically, as far as uh, reading goes. But um, as far as fiction reading goes, uh, James M. Cain, Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett are all the classic right. Some of them even wrote for the movies, um, but a lot of their novels were made into movies. So um, Sam Spade, Philip Marlowe, uh, detective ones, um, Postman Always Rings Twice, all, all of those are all um, based on their work. But the thing that's great about these books that maybe gets a little lost on screen is they're so much darker <laughs> so much darker because in a book you there wasn't that censorship so um yeah there's such great reads and also the i mean i i guess if i had to pick i'd probably say raymond chandler is maybe my favorite um but james and kane writes really good characters like when you're reading it you're like everything this person is doing and saying makes perfect sense because he really knows his characters so even though you're like i wouldn't maybe do that it's like it's just the logical next step in the story but raymond chandler does the more detective uh sort of ones um so yeah i don't know i have a book of his that has four in one and it's too far away so i can't, I can't read this blind to tell you what's in it but it's the first four books so good <laughs> he, when I read uh, Raymond Chandler or a lot of these film noir uh, books, if that makes sense, books that were made into film noir, the language is so funny. Like the turn of phrase and just the evocative language. And like if anybody else tried to do this, it would just be so cheesy. Like it would just be like, you know, just calm down, drink some water. Like, <laughs> you know, what I mean, you don't have to like use such intense words but the way they talk and the words they put in their characters mouth it makes perfect sense and i absolutely love it last time i was reading raymond chandler i was literally laughing out loud even though there was there was murder there was some guy was in an asylum there was like drug use there was like all of this stuff so um just love it <laughs> so if you're a reader definitely get on top of those three the other one is again Walter Mosley who wrote Devil in a Blue Dress. Um, he has a detective character who is, um, I think it's they're set in LA, but I could be wrong actually now that I've said it out loud, but they're so good. And they're in the same kind of vein of um, film noir and um, detective fiction and that kind of thing. I think they're set in the 40s but the characters are often black. So it's just kind of interesting um, to have like that other perspective. Um, or not even other perspective, but just the other side of the coin. I don't know, like they're so good. So those are my recommendations for reading. Um, and that is basically everything I have to say about film noir. <laughs> it's quite a lot, huh? Um, so yeah, this is kind of a long one, but I felt like uh, if you're maybe watching some of my other videos 
that talk about film noir, it's kind of difficult sometimes if you're like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, well, I can't tell you in one sentence. <laughs> so <laughs> that's like the point. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I might, film noir is probably one of my favorite genres or movements in film. Um, but yeah, I might talk about B movies or something at some point. So if there's something you, um, I mean, let me know if there's something you're kind of like, I don't get this or, you know, tell me, explain this to me <laughs> and I will try and do my best to do that. Or I might pick another genre. I think, um, screwball comedy might be a fun one to do a little dive into as well. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, yeah, thank you for watching and, um, I appreciate every one of you guys and yeah, no, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs>